Aloha, Condo Insiders, and welcome to the show. I'm your host today, Cheryl Franklin, and in lieu of the current affairs in our world today, we're going to discuss safety precautions when living in a condo community. Our guest today is Mike Terman, a successful general manager for condo communities. Mike will discuss these safety precautions for condo living. Aloha, Mike, and welcome to the show. Hi, Cheryl. It's good to see you again. It's been a while and I appreciate the invitation here today. Absolutely. And you're right. It has been a while. We'll have to fix that going forward. <laughs> Why don't you uh, tell the viewership a little bit about yourself? Um, well, uh, everybody knows my name now. My name is Mike. I've been in Hawaii for about 30 years. I came over in the military in 1989. Uh, absolutely fell in love with Hawaii and knew that it was going to be home. Uh, shortly after getting out of the military in the early 90s, I got lucky and found myself with a very fortunate opportunity in my first small building down in Kaka'ako, uh, 75 units, one man show, all senior citizens, and uh, just found that it was, a, it was an industry at that time that was still quite uh, new, and I succeeded well in it. Uh, developed a great network of, of people back then. The Kaminis uh, early on were still new to the industry, but already making a name for themselves. And here I am nearly 30 years later uh, doing this. I, I love property management. Uh, you and I have worked together in the past. I got lucky, married a beautiful uh, local lady, have three kids. And honestly, I can't see doing anything else. I'll do this as long as I can I'll walk around and as long as a, a property will have me, this is this is definitely the trade, the industry that has uh, become my passion. Yeah, yeah, great. No, that sounds wonderful. And I, you're right, we did work together on a couple of uh, projects and I have a great deal of respect for you and I think you're awesome. And I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, it's yeah. my pleasure. Thank you, thank you. So let's uh, dive right in. I mean, there's a lot going on. I know we're kind of, most of us are kind of, you know, hunkering down inside, but I think um, essential workers are kind of out and about, but more importantly, when you live in a condo community, we're kind of on top of each other per se, and there's a way to kind of mitigate through that, adhering to the guidelines of, you know, of all the, um, kind of separating and things like that and washing your hands. So you are on the front line in that respect in this industry. So why don't we kind of talk about a little bit um, one of the key elements in all of this, communication. Uh, absolutely, Cheryl. Um, effective communications, uh, I think, starts with the relationship that you have with your community, uh, recognizing all the different types of uh, communities that are out there, ranging from the low-income apartment communities to the high-end upscale Kaka'ako properties, blue-collar, white-collar. Uh, effective communications is really going to be uh, strongly contingent on the type of relationship you have with your community. Um, what type of interactions do you have with them directly on a face-to-face -face basis? How often are you seeing them on a regular basis? Uh, what types of communications do you have in place? Uh, do you use bulletin boards? Do you use email blasts, uh, newsletters, uh, websites, uh, mailings? What type of communication works best for your community? And, and that's really going to be contingent on the type of population you have. I myself mm -hmm. manage a high rise down in the University uh, Kapiolani area. A lot of blue collar, a lot of white collar, and, and some higher end uh, residents find they're all very Akamai and we have a strong, very personal connection. And it's easy for me to call all of my residents friends. And so I base my communications around that type of personal um, effect. And they, they like the email blasts. They, they, I've got close to 400 emails that receive my weekly report uh, to keep them abreast of what's going on in our community. Uh, COVID-19 being dominant right now. Oh yeah, sure, sure. And that was going to lead to my next question: is how often we should communicate? You know, I know with everyone being home and conquering hunk in, it's kind of like, you know, they want to stay informed outside of the media. Obviously, that's your first uh, line of communication from our government officials. But 
right there at home, I mean, the communication within the community is also equally just as important. It, it really is. And of course, I, I personally, I don't know if anybody has ever actually experienced this kind of a situation before. We've had tsunamis and earthquakes, and it's easy to develop a, a procedural policy to respond to those types of events. But this is really something new in the, in, in the country, in the world. So I, I imagine that a lot of general managers now are, are reviewing their, their procedures on how to respond to this. For us right now, any breaking news, we get out to our community immediately as it pertains to COVID-19. Um, things are changing so rapidly in the country and the world and right here in our state that immediate communication, keeping the residents apprised, um, I, I believe it helps mitigate fears. It, it helps reduce panic. When the resident comes by my office, I'm considered an essential worker. Um, yeah. they, they enjoy taking that moment to, to stop by and see if there's anything new. They're asking about my health and I'm asking about theirs, but that immediate awareness of any changes uh, is so vital to help reduce the panic in our building, then in our community, our neighborhood, and ultimately our state. It's, it's keeping everybody informed. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the news, it, 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 there's so much politics involved, people don't know what to yeah. trust. So they're gonna look to that person that they, they trust personally to give them the truth. And that's not to say that falsehoods are going out, but that relationship that you've developed, they trust you. My residents, I believe, trust me. And if I'm gonna tell them something, I better be 100% accurate. And if I don't feel I can be, I'm gonna tell them I really don't have an answer on that subject. Yeah, I think that's key. That's key, you're right. There is so much information out there, so much politics and things like that, but the priority is safety and you can build from that just establishing or having a relationship of trust with the community and with your um, association. So I think trust um that's something we don't have enough of in the world today so it's always good when when you have it right there at home um i that's correct. also want to ask yeah yeah so also have you had to make many uh operational adjustments because like you said you're considered an essential worker not everyone is um and you can probably touch it touch on that a little bit, but um, being an essential worker means you're there, but you probably had to make some operational adjustments as well. That's that's correct. One of the first things that I did, and I think this kind of segues between communications and, and operational adjustments, I've had to speak to my team. Uh, I have a small team, we're not a big building, uh, but I do have a small team and I'm communicating with them on a regular basis so that they stay educated what our expectations are for them within the building. Uh, up until recently, we had a, a very successful preventive maintenance program. During this situation, during the pandemic, our focus has become primarily custodial and janitorial. We are sweeping through the building on a regular basis as often as possible, just to make sure that we're hitting all those key components using disinfectants, keeping the elevator buttons wiped down, things of that nature. Um, we've had to close our pool uh, with people in self-isolation or self-quarantine. Uh, we fear that they might want to gather down at the pool because they, they want to get out of their homes. And unfortunately, that can result in gatherings of large groups. Um, right. So we've stopped right. mailing parcels for, for our residents because there's too much personal contact between the carriers uh, my staff, the residents. So now residents don't have the luxury of looking to us to receive their packages and parcels when they are traveling or away until we can get through this. So the operational adjustments for us, really focusing in on what's critical to maintain the COVID virus, and that's custodial and janitorial services. And once I feel we've gotten through that on a, on a very strong basis, I myself, I'm letting my staff return home early so that they can attend to their own personal needs. Not everybody has that luxury, but I stay on site throughout the business day for communications and I send my team home. Wow, wow, that's a, that's a great practice. Um, they're very lucky to have you at the helm there. Um, as you can tell, you know, I just a moment ago 
touch my face and <laughs> something that we should not do. So it's we definitely have a new normal that we're trying to, you know, kind of adhere to and things are changing and we're doing our best to, to get things right and be conscientious about uh, making sure we maintain what is it, six feet distance and things like that. And I applaud you. I think, you know, sanitation of course and disinfectants and wiping down common areas is very important because let's face it, if you live in a building that has an elevator, you know, that's kind of a tight quarter. So everybody has to, you know, do their part in trying to, to mitigate or flatten the spread of, you know, um, COVID-19. Um, I think that's also a very good point that you bring up um, as it pertains to amenities and, you know, because you know, even where I live, the kids are going nuts and they want to go out in the in the courtyard here and they want to play and they want to get out. But, you know, that constitutes, you know, a gathering. And so it's a, it's, it's, it's different. And who's there to kind of monitor and keep people aware of all of these um, guidelines? You know, you're, you're on the front lines there. And one of the few that need to be commended for for getting out there and, and helping to keep order in the, in the midst of all this. Um, good good plan as well to kind of, you know, not accept those packages, but, you know, until this is over, we're just gonna have to um, realize that we don't have a lot of those things that we took for granted that were actually, you know, we appreciate. You know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't express how Akamai, my, my, my residents have been. And I say my, um, it, it, it's a very, um, it's personal thing. You know, we, we take possession, we take ownership uh, of our buildings. Any, I think any competent manager would. So I call them my residents. But I'm really impressed with how Akamai, my residents have been uh, leading up to where we're at today and where we could possibly be in the coming days. They've been very patient. They've been very understanding. Um, not every hardship has been uh, warmly received, but it's not without understanding. They, they know that our best interest is their best interest. Um, one of the things that we are struggling with right now are, are homeowners who, who are financially invested in large scale renovation projects. Um, and so yeah. without a home, some of these vendors have, have been classified as essential so they could make the homes habitable again. Um, and now we're struggling with noise issues uh, on top of people that are trying to work from home. It's it's a real balancing act. Um, and we don't have all of the answers. And again, being honest about not even having an answer for them uh, or a solution for them, at least lets them know we're hearing them, we're aware of it, and we're working to get everybody through this as equitably as possible. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's very important. And that's kind of, you know, the the deal where we live, you know, Akamai and Aloha. So we're, we'll get through this and we'll get through it together. And uh, we're gonna take a moment for a break and this is a good place for a break and we'll come right back and continue the conversation with Mike. Thank you. Look forward to it. Rusty Kamori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. I feature a wide range of amazing guests who share valuable insights about how going beyond the lines leads to success in everything you do in life. I'm looking forward to you joining me every Monday at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to the Condo Insider Show. Thank you for returning and joining, or if you're just joining us. 
Uh, welcome. We're talking about condo living during this uh, era of COVID-19 and how to navigate through that when you live in a condo association or community. Um, before we went to the break, we were talking about uh, some of the sacrifices that we've had to make in a community as it relates to scheduling contractors and who's deemed essential employees and why. And I, I, I'd like for, for you to touch on, Mike, how do you navigate between the two when it comes to scheduled maintenance or contractors or projects that were in the pipeline to, to perform and things of that nature? Because I imagine, you know, all of the projects that were scheduled are not deemed emergency, if you will, or essential. So if you could touch on that a little bit. Uh, absolutely. Um, we do have a few units within our building that, that were in renovations when this hit. And as a result of those renovations, some of our residents, uh, typically homeowners, they're displaced because of these renovations. So in communications with the president uh, and our account executive, we've determined that allowing those homeowners to continue their renovations is considered essential. They need a home, they need workable plumbing systems, electrical systems. So we're allowing that type of work to continue. But looking out to the future coming days, weeks, possibly months, uh, we have let it be known to our residents that plumbing shutdowns, power outages for routine repairs, we're gonna be declining them. Uh, if there's not an immediate threat to life or property, then those types of repairs are just going to have to sit on the wayside. If somebody says they need a valve replaced, we're not going to permit that replacement unless we have an active leak. And it's confirmed by myself or one of my team members because we can't have anybody taking advantage of, of the operations just to get something done that they think is important to them, but isn't necessarily a high priority for the community as a whole. Yeah, yeah, a lot to navigate there. And then I imagine, you know, there are gonna, going to be instances where, you know, some homeowners, and I, I, I won't say they may not be happy about that because I believe during this time, everybody understands, we all get it. And so we understand that these things have to come into play because it's, it's the state of current affairs where we live right now. That, that, that's correct. And, yeah. and ultimately, uh, the plumbing won't be shut down unless you know my staff and I facilitate the shutdown. So they're scheduling work that's going to require our assistance yeah. to facilitate it. Uh, they'll really just be spinning their wheels. Um, they may express their upset, their ire to myself or the board. But ultimately, mm -hmm. we have to do what is, is really best for the community as a whole in unprecedented times. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think, like you said, these times are unprecedented, so we all have to do our part. Um, it sounds like you have a, a, a very uh, strong operational system that you're putting in place that's evolving, I imagine, every, every day or every week as, you know, the guidelines change every week in terms of, you know, the, um, the mandate and, and controlling this. Um, operations as far as your staff and personnel i applaud you for giving them the opportunity as well to tend to their their families and things like that so it's it's quite a balancing act um it, it really is and and i think everything uh, can quickly point back to our very first topic is communication this situation is so fluid uh, and, and updates are coming from the, from the federal, state, city, and county levels on such a rapid basis. Uh, updates of numbers, uh, updates of, of changes in guidelines. Our, you know, our personal lives are affected even as managers. Our, our children are now out of school for another month, and we have to manage that at home while we're still trying to provide the very best in quality of services for our residents within the community. So it, it really ties everything together. Um, you know, years ago, we used to talk about uh, what we do, Gerald, as, as uh, building managers and general managers. And uh, there's been this move. We're community managers now. A anybody can manage a building, but being able to really develop a relationship and a strong rapport with the people that, that live in that building, we're community managers now. And I, I feel so lucky to have such a great community that understands 
the balance that I'm trying to keep at home, the balance I'm trying to keep for my staff so that they can manage their own personal needs. And of course, their well-being as my residents and homeowners, they're, they're just so wonderful and so cooperative and extremely patient that the bad news when it comes, they know it wouldn't be coming if it wasn't factual and correct. And that, that respect that, that they've given me, that trust that they've given me is all because we've developed that communications um, confidence early on since I've been there now three years at, at Skyrise. Oh, nice, nice, yeah. I, 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 you know, I think that's wonderful. You know, I know of instances being in the industry as long as I have and, 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 and all the uh, connections that I have, I know that it's been challenging for a number of homeowner associations. And I also know it was a challenge initially because as you know, this is the time of year when a lot of associations have annual meetings and things like that. And they weren't sure how or to cancel the meeting, uh, you know, to be in adherence with their uh, governing documents and state statutes like that. But like you said, this is unprecedented. So I think, you know, as long as you adhere to the guidelines and you, um, and in, in trying to keep with your governing documents. I think it was last week, I want to say, uh, Richard Emery and Steve Glanstein were on were, were on the show. And you can go back and, and revisit the show of last Thursday. And they gave some very good information on how to cancel and reconvene annual meetings and things like that. Because these are things that have come up, you know, in the midst of COVID-19 during uh, a very cyclical time for condo associations where they generally have their annual meetings and things like that. Do you, did you run into any instances where you had to cancel meetings and give notice and post new notices and things like that? Or did everybody just kind of figure that out in conjunction with that? Well, it's it's funny you mention it. Uh, Steve Glanstein is our parliamentarian for our property. Um, I've known he and, and Richard Emery for a great many years. We actually have an annual meeting scheduled for this coming week, the 31st. And with oh, the wow. notices and everything that have, have gone out, um, it left us in a quandary. So we, we reached out to legal. We reached out to Steve to find out um, how within our governing documents can we stay legal. And as it turns out, we, we've got communication going out to the homeowners, uh, as well as posted and email blasted to our homeowners. Uh, we, we still have to have a meeting technically, uh, but we don't even have a meeting room because our reserve, a reserved uh, site was canceled because it was a DOE cafeteria. So we're uh, going to have our president, board member and myself uh, on site, outside the fence. Um, and basically, we're going to go through the process, the formal process, calling the meeting to order, um, making everybody that might be in attendance aware of what's happening and adjourn the meeting to another date, which we are also working right now to identify. But meeting locations are scarce to come by because nobody knows when they're going to be able to be available for large groups again. Right, right. So it's kind of like everything is on hold, I imagine. I imagine Steve's getting a lot of phone calls. <laughs> um, I, I and really imagine, you know, it's, it must be very, very trying for him. But that's that's why he gets paid the big dollars, and he's he's so specialized <laughs> in, his, in his in his trade. Yeah, he's great. He'll, he's great. I'll have to remind him of that. <laughs> and counsel too. But you know, at the end of the day, I think you know, I think. A lot's going to change. A lot's go going to change in terms of compliance with everything because this is unprecedented. And I think, you know, I think if anybody challenges anything during uh, at a time like this, you know, you know, how to handle these things in terms of a pandemic, uh, you know, they didn't write that into the legislation when they were planning. Um, uh, these things. So it may change in the future, but for now, we just have to, like you said, listen to parliamentarians, your property managers, your council, and things of that nature, and communicate and just keep everybody informed until we can return to normal. And we don't even know what that's going to look like when it happens. Yeah. That's, that's such a great statement. We, we don't know what the end result is going to be. 
Um, you know, everybody's struggling with the economy. I have so many homeowners that have to work from home and so many that aren't working at all. So what's where are we going to be at in a week, two weeks, a month, three months, this time next year? Uh, society could be so different because of this. And, and one of the funny things I recognized is several years ago in another uh, community, uh, a large community, uh, the staff and I felt it was appropriate to put hand sanitizers uh, in the lobbies. And that was met with uh, wow. with some upset uh, by by people. I, I, no names mentioned. Fair enough. We removed them. And now you can't find a, find a hand sanitizing station to save your life. They're on back order. I was fortunate to get one, but I'd like to have at least a half a dozen others. Uh, opinions have changed so much about condo life. You know, we've always been aware uh, in condominium living noises and odors and you know, the routine daily things. But now people are taking stairs because they don't want to ride next to somebody in the elevator. Uh, people people are, are not ordering takeout as much as they used to. Uh, it, things have changed so much within the condominium community. And I'm seeing people on a daily basis during hours I would have never seen them before because they're forced to stay at home. It, it's really changing the operations and all I can do is take notes whenever I experience something different from the norm. So I can put that into the book later on when we're upgrading our, our, our policies and procedures. Yeah, yeah, definitely. SOPs are going to change quite a bit after this. And we have no idea what our new normal will be. We have no idea how to deal with the consequences of this, because as you said, many folks are at home. Um, many folks are not working. The unemployment rate is going to skyrocket, and that could lend itself to a surge in uh, delinquencies and things like that. And we know we know how problematic that can become. You know, that's kind of uh, how you do business from you know maintenance fees, and and when that's not consistent, or you don't know how to budget for. Um, for things that you may or may not have to eventually write off, it makes it makes accounting and it makes budgeting and it makes everything uh, a bit of a challenge. And then you have to, you know, look for ways to reevaluate that, and that can affect everyone from the staff to amenities um, and things of that nature. So we don't know what the new normal will be, um, but. Like you said, if we just stay in communication, regular communication and with uh, the community and uh, do our best to make sure that everybody is safe and things of that nature, that's all we can do um, one day at a time because we, we didn't have a manual for this. <laughs> there was no pandemic manual. So, so, so true, so true. In Hawaii, tsunamis, earthquakes, Hurricanes. These are things that I'm sure any competent manager has has some sort of a response procedure uh, in their in their guidelines. This is one we've never really thought about. And, and funny, considering our location between the Far East and the mainland, uh, it would have been something topical in our in our opinions because we're the gateway between two different uh, two different life lifestyles, uh, Asia and and America. But guaranteed, it's going to be in our policy manual now. I can't imagine who else is thinking about the changes that they've got to make to their own. Uh, but again, here in Hawaii, the Aloha spirit that we will get through it um, at, the, at my community level, the people I'm seeing standing in the long lines at Costco and the grocery stores, I haven't seen anybody acting in despair. Um, so to me, I just, I know that I'm lucky I live Hawaii and, and I want to thank you for allowing this opportunity to, to talk about this because at our level, where the, where the rubber meets the road, I think our, our industry really needs to hear this uh, in a different venue than what they're hearing on the radio um, and the public statements from our governmental leadership. So thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate the opportunity and the invitation. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And I agree. And um, I echo your sentiments in terms of I've only seen, you know, a lot of aloha you know, I think that we're coming together and we will get through this. And I thank you for coming on the show and giving uh, and giving the viewership 
uh, things to think about that maybe they hadn't thought about. I mean, you're, you're a plethora of good information and these are things that we're gonna have to continue to talk about over, I imagine, it, well, we know at least another month or so. And uh, so we'll, we'll just continue to communicate, if you will, um, and communicate and, um, and kind of take things one day at a time as we kind of uh, figure out our new normal. But we'll just we'll just keep talking about these things. I imagine we're going to have you on again if you'll if you'll join us. And um, you you know how to get in touch with me. It's it's my pleasure. Anything I can do to serve my community, um, I'm here for you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, and we really appreciate it. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in, and please tune in again. Uh, like I said, we're going to continue these shows. We're going to continue talking about the things that you want to hear. Um, we. Uh, kind of moved away from our normal programming, if you will, um, because at this time, you know, we're at a different state um, in terms of uh, of the world, if you will. So uh, we're going to be focusing on this topic for a little while. And please uh, do uh, write in if you have topics that you'd like us to discuss, and we can certainly visit that. So thank you for joining and come again. Uh, aloha. Stay